Professor Watson and Professor Ridley. Um, James Watson is a Nobel Prize winning geneticist and molecular biologist who was awarded the 1962 prize in medicine as one of the discoveries of the structure of DNA. Based on this work, he went on to write the seminal textbook, The Molecular Biology of the Gene, and the best-selling, The Double Helix. He served as director and president of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, one of the world's leading centers for cancer and neurobiology research for 35 years. More recently, Professor Watson helped found, um, sorry, he was the first director of the Human Genome Project. His autobiography, Avoid Boring People, Lessons from a Life in Science, was published in 2007. Uh, Professor Matt Ridley is also here tonight. He is a journalist, writer and businessman. In 2004, he won the National Academy's Book Award for Nature via Nurture. And in 2007, he won the David Prize for the US History of Science Society for Francis Crick. And his book, The Rational Optimist, is actually on sale tonight outside. It's not usually not, so it's quite an opportunity if you're a <coughs> So without further ado, would you please put your hands together very warmly for Professor Watson and Professor Lynn Ridley. Good evening, everybody. Um, I think I'm going to start by... Jim, if you don't mind, reading a paragraph from my book about Francis Crick, because it's about you, actually. Um, and, uh, and it's about a warm spring day, very like today, at about the same time of year. Saturday, the 28th of February, 1953, was a fine spring day. The crocuses were flowering along the banks of the River Cam. Watson came into work before the others and began playing with his cardboard bases. Quite suddenly, he saw something that, once seen, would never be unseen again. Adenine paired with thymine, separated by the distance of a parallel hydrogen bond, was exactly the same shape as cytosine paired with guanine. Each base pair, being the same shape as the other, could go anywhere in the core of the helices. So, Jim, can you cast your mind back to that warm spring day at the end of February 1953, was it really a eureka moment like that? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, I had the, you know, saw them. And I, Francis on Saturdays would come in between 10 and 10.30. And he would read Nature before he came in. I think it came out a day later in, in this. Test. And uh, I showed it to him. And he immediately realized, he looked at them, uh, that the chains would be anti-parallel. <laughs> so the symmetry demanded that one go up and one go down. Which he'd already Which he had sort already of guessed might be true. No, not guess. Well, guessed. Because two weeks before, we had uh, Max Bruce had shown us a uh, research report from the King's College group summarizing their last two years, which pointed out the space group of DNA. And... It was a space group that Francis knew well because it was that assumed by his hemoglobin crystals that he was working on. And that space group meant that the chains ran in opposite directions. It's so uh, the base pairs demanded the chains run in opposite direction. So in a sense, uh, the space group was a prediction of our model. <laughs> And so uh, I think from that instant, we both believed the structure was solved. And the other was, of course, uh, having the base pairs meant that uh, if you separated the chains, each provided the information for the, a complementary chain, which is what we've been searching for and talked about uh, for the past uh, something like 17 months. The idea that you, you automatically encoded a linear digital code or you automatically replicated a linear digital code if you separated the chains, that, that's, that's the, the, the eureka thing. You know, you suddenly see that the way heredity works in the molecule shape. Yes. So, uh, you know, I think almost immediately I got worried, you know, could it be so pretty and not true? Okay, because so Because if it was true, you know, I was going to be very, very famous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was... You are. I am, but... 
<laughs> it was already obvious from looking at that structure. I mean, it was so beautiful. You know. Was okay. Well, j just a, a couple of hours later, you both walk into the Eagle, the pub, the pub yes. in, uh, for, for lunch, and allegedly, although. Francis didn't remember this, but uh, you did. He, or was it the no, other way around? No, I, no, uh, no, he, I had, he to, said, no, he I said, had to write a novel, so I had to. So I was, you know, in the double helix, I had to write the story as it should have happened. I mean, there was, <laughs> <laughs> and, and knowing Francis, it would have been impossible for him to walk in without being excited by what we had done. Allegedly, he said, we've, um, we've discovered the secret of life yes. to everybody in the pub. Yes. Well, that's what we realized, for, you know, for the hour before we had discovered the secret of life. But you felt queasy at this point. You felt he was over-boasting already, and that, that maybe, well, uh, I was sort you of know, solely, we needed to check. Uh, sort of superstitious. I didn't, you know... <laughs> You know, I had come to Cambridge where good manners was understate everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, you know, Francis was never that, and I was trying to be accepted, and so I wanted to be, you know, understated. Well, this continued, because after you'd... Well, once you drafted a paper about this discovery, yeah. which was going to be sent off to Nature, yeah. it was Francis Crick who wanted to put in a lot of stuff about the implications of this yes. for cracking the coding problem, and it was you who wouldn't let it in because you said that's going too far. Well, I thought it would be, you know, the, the most perfect understated manuscript in the world if we didn't mention it at all. Of course, then people would think we didn't understand it. <laughs> So we couldn't do that, and so we ended up by putting, it has not escaped our notice that our structure provides a, a method for, you know, copying them. Uh, Which is one of the great lines. Well, it, it is, but, you know, you could just say, uh, they were rather, you know, juvenile. <laughs> um, uh, you know, you might as well come out, and of course, uh, you know, at that time, uh, See, we knew when the paper came out there were going to be two other papers from uh, King's College. And I just didn't want to overwhelm them too much. I just thought it would be bad manners. <laughs> <laughs> when you... Well, we'll and so we wrote the paper that appeared a month later. Yeah. That came out something like the 30th of May. Uh, which was genetical implications of the structure of DNA. And that would have just taken, a, you know, quite a long way to say it. And, you know, we ended up with one sentence. We could have had one paragraph. Uh, and, and who wrote that paper? Because you told me that Francis drafted it, but uh, when I went through the archive, I found a, a handwritten draft of it in your handwriting. <laughs> My memory, that shows you how my memory isn't very good. <laughs> because uh, uh, when I wrote the manuscript, I can say more, uh, Francis was not enthusiastic for me to write up the story of, you know, involving people. He wanted a logical story. Uh, I remember Francis writing most of the second paper. Then uh, I wrote much of the third paper, the Cold Spring Harbor manuscript, which was really a repetition of the Second Nature paper. Right. And then the fourth paper was the sort of how we actually arrived at the structure of the more scientific one. And I actually wrote that paper because Francis was had a deadline to finish his thesis so he could get on a boat to take himself to uh, the United States. Right. Uh, so... Right. But it and was, and uh, both, both of you, your sister typed the very first yeah. paper and, and Francis's wife drew the diagram in yeah, it, her well, deal. Yeah. My memory is at that time neither Francis or I knew how to type and I still don't and you know uh, I don't know who Francis does. <laughs> you know everything was longhand and uh, yeah. uh, Well I want to take you back now a little further back in the story because you arrive in Cambridge in September 1951 and you're kind of 
wandering around the world looking for someone who's going to take the problem of the gene seriously because you're convinced it's made of DNA but you've been to Copenhagen and the people there are they're just boring biochemists and they're not seeing the big picture and you've you're kind of wearing the patients thin of the people who are paying your grant because you keep changing where you want to go but you pitch up in Cambridge and you're thrown into a room to share a room with this man you've never met before and suddenly within an hour you're talking about DNA can you remember that that occasion meeting Francis well, Craig sir I, th I think I can say Francis was the first person I could ever truly speak to because he was the first person that saw the DNA problem you know is an information problem <laughs> and uh, and he saw that you know the most direct way to go after the structure was to build models because uh, but he wouldn't have done it if you hadn't shown up no 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 he wouldn't have sparked done the whole thing but uh, uh, you know, to avoid boring people I sort of give rules for uh, you know how to go after you know big science and uh, uh, the first rule was uh, uh, work in something uh, before other people do <laughs> you know, uh, which is uh, uh, don't go into a crowded field and you know as it was it was a horse race with three horses no, which is about what I would say, you know, don't, you know, if you've got five people trying to do what you are, <laughs> maybe you're, you're in the wrong win. field. Right. And uh, so, you know, but, and the second rule is don't work on it just because you're, you know, it's a good idea, but you must have a way to win. And, uh, you know, I, you know, I'm sure within an hour, Francis and I were talking about building models. Because Linus Pauling had done that uh, six months before and coming to the Alpha Helix. Mm -hmm. So if Pauling hadn't succeeded with the Alpha Helix, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have had the feeling that <laughs> just ignore the crystallographic data because it confuses you. <laughs> and ask what the chemical data, uh, you know, how would a polypeptide, or in this case, how would a polynucleotide chain like to fold up? Mm -hmm. So uh, we realized that, the, uh, that we had to think like chemists. Uh, Pauling had succeeded with the alpha, his, but his whole life had been a chemist, right? uh, I mean, had been as a chemist, whereas Francis knew zero chemistry. And I essentially took the chemistry courses uh, at the University of Chicago, which uh, people who wanted, then it was women, nurses take. So I took the easy chemistry courses <laughs> because I thought I'm going to be a naturalist, so I don't have to know it. So uh, I have really very poor training. And we wouldn't have arrived at the structure. We wouldn't have that Eureka Saturday morning if there hadn't been a chemist in the room with us. Uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Donahue. Donahue who, who uh, looked at, uh, I was trying to make uh, base pairs uh, using the Eno form of thymine and guanine. That's the way all the, the book showed it. And Jerry looked at it and said the hydrogens are in the wrong place and these things. And so... The textbooks are wrong. He said. he said the textbooks are wrong. And the, the first time I tried it using the way he said to do it, I found the base pairs within, you know, probably 20 minutes. So that led to, you know, another rule, never be the brightest person in a room. If you're the brightest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You yeah, because you, you have no one to learn from. Right. And uh, so, uh, which is, you know, you could say, well, why did I come to Cambridge University? Well, I knew other, you know, it was filled with bright people. You knew very little about the team you were going to be joining. Nothing. You know, you know and... Uh, you know, I've probably seen the movie A Yank in Oxford. <laughs> you know, that was my you know, <laughs> preparation for the, you know, what it was going to be like. But within a couple of months, a very interesting episode has happened. You, you've gone down to London to, to attend a, a, a 
symposium uh, at which Rosalind Franklin is speaking and Maurice Wilkins is there. No, it was only Rosalind who was speaking. Yes, yeah, she was speaking, exactly. Yes. And the, because you wanted to find out what they had found out about the structure of DNA. Yes. And you come back and you give the information, well, you give the information to Francis Crick on yes. a train to Oxford where yes. you're both going to see Dorothy Hodgkin. Yes. And Francis Crick says, you know, I think with this information we could start building a model. Yeah. And you come back here and build a model, and it's disastrously wrong. Yeah. This and is December 1951. Yes. Uh, well, probably late last week in uh, November. In November then, and because uh, the seminar was something like 18th or something. Right. And uh, I had confused unicell with asymmetric unit. <laughs> Right. And the asymmetric unit was the nucleotide. <laughs> and so you're talking uh, on quite the wrong scale, and you've got the totally wrong amount of water. On the wrong in scale. It. And so I essentially told Francis the molecule was dry. Right. And so we built a molecule for dry DNA. And the problem here is partly that you're not supposed to be working on DNA at all, either of you, because there's well, a kind of gentleman's agreement that King's College run by... No, that uh, only Randall. gentleman agreement, there was no agreement because uh, Cambridge wasn't working on DNA to start with. Uh, no one in Cambridge was interested in DNA until I arrived. But so when you... When you produce this model and you invite Wilkins and Franklin up to look at it and they say it's nonsense uh, or to put it yeah. politely um, uh, there, there's a bit of a crisis and I'm, I'm, I'm now going to read well, a I think it was a crisis for them not us <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to read a letter that Maurice Wilkins sent yeah. to um, to Francis Crick yes. uh, a week or two later and the fascinating thing about this letter is that it's only just emerged it's one of um, hundreds of letters of Francis Crick that were lost when his office was moved in the 1960s and he thought they'd been thrown away by a, what he called an overzealous secretary um, but in fact it turned out they'd been misfiled with Sidney Brenner's correspondence yes. and Sidney Brenner's papers have just been left to Cold Spring Harbour or given to Cold Spring Harbour and your colleague Alex Gann went through them and discovered these letters. Yes. Um, so this is what uh, Morris Wilkins writes from King's College London. Dear Francis, this is just to say how bloody browned off I am entirely and how rotten I feel about it all and how entirely friendly I am, though it may horribly appear differently. We are really between forces which may grind us all into little pieces. I had to restrain Randall from writing to Bragg complaining about your behaviour. Needless to say, I did restrain him, but so far as your security with Bragg is concerned, it is probably much more important to pipe down and build up the idea of a quiet, steady worker who never creates situations than to collect all the credit for your excellent ideas at the expense of goodwill. And he goes on, and you see, it does make me a bit confused about our discussions. If you get too interested in everything which is important... Where I say confused, I mean confused. I am now largely incapable of any logical thinking in relation to polynuclear cha tied chains or anything. And poor Jim, may I shed a crocodile and very confused tear? <laughs> now, what's fascinating about that letter is that it's got all the ingredients of your double helix story, which we'll come to in a minute, yes. the book you wrote. Uh, in other words, that, that Crick was under pressure to... Uh, prove he was serious um, and that th it's a very very human process science there's a lot of fighting going on there's a lot of you're, you're ground you're being ground into little pieces by by the forces around you um, and when you wrote that in a book people were rather shocked we'll come back back to that in a minute but can does that does that letter surprise you in, in any way well the crocodile tear did <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Did Morris not like you at this stage? I, I, I was probably, you know, too eager to find the structure of DNA. You know, you'd, you'd I trodden, wanted to find it, you know, the next day. You'd trodden on his toes a bit. Yeah, I was, you know, obviously uh, Francis would have never thought about DNA if I hadn't arrived. I had seen Wilkins six months before, and uh, I think he just regarded me as sort of a pest. You know, I was too interested in his problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, 
it's quite interesting to, to read Francis's reply to that letter, which the tone of which is completely different and uh, rather just shows how extraordinarily cocky you two were, really. Um, Dear Morris, just a brief note to thank you for the letters and to try to cheer you up. We think the best thing to get things straight is for us to send you a letter setting out in a mild manner our point of view. This will take a day or so, so we hope you'll excuse the delay. Please don't worry about it because we've all agreed that we must come to an amicable agreement. So cheer up and take it from us that if we kicked you in the pants, it was between friends, we hope our burglary will at least produce a united front in your group. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, it didn't. <laughs> Which it didn't? It didn't, no. And when you wrote a book some years later, pointing out that this is what science is actually like, everyone was shocked and horrified. Yeah, because they think, well, we want to find the truth, we want to, so we'll collaborate with each other. Whereas, uh, we're all slightly afraid if we see someone who thinks like they're better than us and are going to beat us to what we want to find. So I think that's human, but uh, it's not the pictures, you know, that you, in theory, tell your mother, you know, which is, you know, they like to believe their sons have higher aspirations than self-gain. But, uh, of course, we, uh, particularly at the young stage of your career, you only get a job if you do something. And if you haven't done anything, who will give you a job? So, uh, and uh, but is so, science necessarily like that, or, or um, is it possible for it to be much calmer and more collaborative? I mean, what, was it was it inevitable that there would be these? these fallings out and these strange well, if, rivalries if, and if you know uh, there was you know people who said the DNA was if DNA was a gene its structure was clearly going to be an important event you know if DNA wasn't a gene it's you know wouldn't be uh, and you know most people thought it was as boring as carbohydrates you know as a sugar group you know carbohydrates were just by their definition boring and, you know, even when you eat them, I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know vegetables. Uh, so, the, if, but, but I, I want to make uh, a point here, uh, that uh, they made a movie, The Double Helix, and I'm played by Jeff Goldblum. And uh, the whole point of the movie is I'm, you know, racing for a Nobel Prize. I talk about the Nobel Prize. I just want to become famous. That's the way he made the movie. <laughs> that was not the case. Francis and I wanted to find out what the structure of DNA was because we thought it might be the, w the most important problem in biology and could pass dividends. So we were trying to establish ourselves as scientists. <laughs> You know, and of course, you, when you read about great science of the past, you, you know, you want to be, do, uh, you know, you, everyone dreamed that you find out something very important. So, uh, uh, but it was curiosity. You know, both of us, I wanted to have the whole point of the double helix was uh, to be a parody. That is, the, I wanted to make a movie which was to be a parody of Chariots of Fire. <laughs> that uh, where the hero won't run on Sunday. Okay? Well, Francis and I are both running against God. And the reason we're running against God is that, you know, he doesn't exist. I mean, in the sense that we've given up God, we wanted to show that you could understand the world without God. That, that you know. That was part of your motivation? It was a strong motivation. Yes. You know, Francis wasn't allowed to play tennis on Sundays. You know, and, you know. I just had, you know, I, I, he, and I was brought up an Irish Catholic. <laughs> oh, God. You know, and best I say, <laughs> but, you know, I, I won't say any more. And so... <laughs> um, 
th this point about the united front I want to come back to because you two had a united front totally. and, and and you you had chemistry even though you didn't know chemistry you you had chemistry between you if you yes. see what I mean and uh, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins in London did not they couldn't get on and that's crucial isn't it because in this kind of extraordinarily complex problem you do need to spark off other people you can't solve a problem like this on your own and and it was in conversation between you two that, that, that yes. you you made progress over the next year or two no the um uh, the crucial space group I think was found by I don't know who worked it out it wasn't Roslyn uh, but it was known before uh, uh, the data from Morris Wilkins was passed on to Roslyn Franklin and she Please. didn't know how to interpret it Raymond Gosling probably uh, uh, Yes, it was, I think Gosling. And so she went to Oxford, and that's not in the double helix because I only learned of it uh, indirectly from Jack Dunnitz, who was present when Rosalind went to Oxford and uh, asked Dorothy uh, for what her... The Dorothy space, Hodgkin. Hodgkin. Yes, what the space group would be. And uh, Rosalind made the mistake of saying there are five possible space groups. There are, you know, two or three hundred of them. There are a lot of them. And uh, uh, Dorothy immediately replied, uh, there's only three, because mirror symmetry doesn't exist in biology. And uh, so Rosalind didn't know <laughs> about that. And so uh, Dorothy just felt Rosalind, and yeah. Rosalind was worked with x-rays, but had never received any formal training in crystallography, <laughs> and never solved a structure. And uh, so instead of Dorothy thinking about the space group, she told Rosalind to go in the other room and learn about space groups from Jack Dunnitz. <laughs> well, <laughs> Rosalind, you know, felt mortified because Dorothy was treating her as if she didn't know anything and never, you know, I think got on the train and went back to London as fast as possible and never talked about that space group to anyone. And uh, if she had talked about it to Francis, he would have immediately told her that two chains running in opposite direction go home and find how the two chains are held together. And that's what he would have done. And she would have found the double helix. Yeah. If she had asked the right person for help. The, the, the thing which is the human thing which makes it hard is the only people you really get the best help from are your competition. And you're afraid of them. That they will steal what you're doing. So... Uh, Rosalind, I think, was a bit paranoid that uh, for some reason people would steal from her. You know, whereas it really, you get more ahead in this world assuming that people are nice rather than evil. <laughs> but I think Rosalind had that other view and certainly, you know, regarded me as, you know, someone who <laughs> would do anything to find the DNA structure. You know. Um, I now want to, Jim, if you will, let me take the conversation forward to the 1960s. 1965, you're back in Cambridge from Harvard yes. uh, on a sabbatical, and you sit down and write a book, which you've already drafted a couple of chapters of, um, and you've been encouraged by the novelist Naomi Mitchison to complete this book. Uh, and uh, it's... Uh, it's a book like nobody's ever written before because it's a non-fiction novel. No, actually I've been encouraged by another woman. I was named Dorothy de Santiana. She was a literary woman in Boston. And uh, I told her I had some chapters and sent them to her. Oh, you actually showed her the early chapters? Yes, I showed early chapters to Dorothy because... Uh, yeah, she, she moved in Boston literary circles and told me to, uh, that was later, to, to show them to Hoffman Mifflin. Right. And so I went and... Is this before you come to Cambridge to finish the book? Before I finished it. Okay. And, and took it to uh, a man named Paul Brooks, who was the editor-in-chief, and uh, he turned it down. With the opening chapters. Now, he's 
he was very famous with just cause. He he made Houghton Mifflin rich through Roger Tory Peterson's bird guides. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which so goes the, back to your bird watching. And, you, and yeah. Naomi Mitchell only saw it saw it because uh, I went went to her house and wrote uh, to, uh, the next to the last chapter. You there. finished it with finished with, with Naomi Mitchell, yeah, right? I mean, the, but, she was a writer, but it was Dorothy, and. Uh, but you've already got this first sentence written. You've had that for a long time. I had, yes, yes. And the famous first sentence, which everybody knows, is, I have never seen Francis Crick in a modest mood. Yes, that slightly changed. It was first, I have never seen Francis in a modest mood, and people the Crick made came me in put later. Crick. They told me they had Crick. And you go on at the end of the first paragraph to say, although some of his closest colleagues realized the value of his quick, penetrating mind and frequently sought his advice, he was often not appreciated, and most people thought he talked too much. <laughs> yeah, well, it's absolutely true. I mean, everything I wrote, uh, but, uh, you know, but this, it, this it gives the wrong impression. But as I said, this, is a, this turns out to be a remarkable book. I mean, for, for those of us who have written about science, it is the, the beginning of proper science writing, because it's, for the first time, it's, it's not a, a, a reverential account of scientists gliding towards the truth seamlessly. It's, it's, it's a human story. It's a non-fiction novel, and it's called Honest Jim, and you're almost consciously reflecting Lucky Jim, yes, Kingsley uh, Amos's novel, in which a guy sort of bumbles well, through to Jim. a triumph. You see, and also in, Lord in, Jim. In most cases, you know, and you could say an honest Jim. Was I honest? <laughs> you know, the, the Lucky Jim was like, was he lucky? <laughs> Lord Jim was, you know, Not and honest Jim was I honest? And... Uh, the honest Jim came from what well, we see that, and I explained it. In this, uh, uh, I was with uh, Alfred Tissios, who had, was a fellow king, so, and we were in uh, Switzerland. We were uh, starting up for, uh, from Zinal, and a group came down, and there was always Seed, the one who had worked with Morris Wilkins. And he looked at me and said, How's honest Jim? <laughs> And on a mountain in Switzerland, you bump into another molecular biologist, and he, he he's says, from Kings, and so it was quite clear that I was not regarded as honest, <laughs> because you don't call on someone honest if he's honest. <laughs> you know, but there are exceptions, honest Abe or something like this. You know. Anyway, but, you uh, you finish writing this book in in 1965 in here in. Well, in Cambridge and, and yes. in Naomi Mitchison's house. Um, and you send a copy to Francis Crick. Yes. And uh, he doesn't read it. And you send him another reminder in March of the next well, year I saying, think by then I'd, I'd found a publisher. Harvard University Press. And I think then he got worried that it might come out. And he didn't like the first paragraph. There, there were... Uh, neither the line is falling, you know, I described, you know... The it wasn't just the first paragraph, he didn't like the book at all. I mean, when, when, when eventually he writes you a seven-page letter in September 1967, yeah. uh, in 67, 66, yeah. I mean, yeah. in, in a rage, he said, the letter ends... My objection, in short, is to the widespread dissemination of a book which grossly invades my privacy, and I have yet to hear an argument which adequately excuses such a violation of friendship. If you publish your book now in the teeth of my opposition, history will condemn you. This isn't just a little tiff between friends. He's, he's, well, he's, he's angry. Yeah, but I... Yeah. You know, Francis, about 90% of the time, was very sensible. 10% uh, of the time, he's just off his rocker. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I had shown the manuscript to enough people who said it was good and should be published that I just... And, and no one thought the book in any way libeled Francis. You know... Uh, He's the hero of the book. I mean, he, the, whole, the book is, is about this yes, man who nobody appreciates and they come to appreciate. Very remarkable man. Uh, and we were talking about earlier. Francis was a, a true genius. I mean, he was very, a super genius. He was, you know, not an ordinary genius. And, you know, uh, there's been no one in Cambridge... Uh, you know, since he left, who's anywhere near his ability? 
Yes, no one. <laughs> you know, they're, they're good, competent people, but not Francis. You know, Aaron Klug is you know, pretty bright, but he's not Francis. You know, Francis was just... Uh, so what didn't he like? Because he didn't really mind his portrayal, your portrayal of him. He didn't really mind the fact that you'd written this book without him. It's that, he, it's that you're, you're making science seem not serious. You're making it sound as if anyone could do it. You're, you're, you're cutting out the fact that a huge amount of work had gone into to getting to the point where you could do it. But you're making it sound like something that happens between tennis matches and, and parties it with was. girls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, no, I think it was. Uh, I think the reason Francis didn't like it is I talked about the fact that people didn't like him. Or were afraid of him, you know. <laughs> you know, he, he he didn't really like the thoughts that he was walking uh, around Cambridge. <laughs> you know, saying that's the man who was in yes, that book. you know, the, the, this man who thinks about my problem without my permission. That's what Francis was. You know, working on your, and of course, I was, you know, <laughs> uh, writing a book without Francis' permission, but. Uh, uh, he, he would never write the book. You know, it, uh, Francis had too good manners to write the double haze. You know, he was constrained. He and Morris wouldn't, you know, wrote these letters. I would just walk into Morris's office. I wouldn't ask for an appointment. Right. Yes, I mean, and, you know, they, and, they, and were so const- they were really constrained by middle middle class morality. <laughs> you know, using the term in the old-fashioned sense. And so Francis Crick and Morris Wilkins both get lawyers to write to Harvard University Press threatening to sue if, if yes. they publish. Yeah, but there, there was a giveaway. Uh, the lawyer said, in the eyes of our clients, is libelous. Ah. <laughs> it didn't say he thought it was libelous. Then I went and got the best libel lawyer in the United States. And uh, he said the book doesn't contain a word of libel. Now, nonetheless, he, he, nonetheless, Harvard University Press decided not to publish it. Which, of course, was great, because that meant that you could go to a commercial publisher, Athenaeum, and, yeah, and the book has and, now sold uh, millions of copies. But, <laughs> no, I would have preferred, you know... <laughs> by this stage, by the, the way, the, the working title who, of the book... The person who ran Athenaeum was a real shit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I shouldn't use that word, but the... You just the, did. The, yeah. the, <laughs> no, but, but the, the reason is, you know, the advance he offered me was so, you know... It's tiny. Yeah, oh, yeah, he was insulting me, you know. Michael Simon Bessio, a creep. You know, that, that was by You've me. made some money out of it since, I hope. No, but, yes, but uh, it wasn't I liked them, whereas, uh, you know, the, the editor... I like the Harvard people. I had nothing against. Yep. I think Pusey was just, you know, why should Harvard, you know... This is the president of Harvard. Yes, be, you know, with this sort of bad sort of... Smell, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with no uh, apparent, because no one said, well, this is going to be the most, you know, admired book ever written about science. No one, you know, uh, for me, uh, you know, at Harvard I was... Someone, you know, I wasn't universally popular at Harvard. Uh, you know, you were having your the, row with E.O. Wilson at the time about uh, yeah, whether wanted, his kind I, of biology was serious. I wanted to get serious. rid of old-fashioned biology. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, uh, you know, no, I was a troublemaker at Harvard. You know. And, you know, I objected when they didn't raise my salary when I got a Nobel Prize. So, but, you know, I knew the book didn't hurt Francis. The one person I worried about in the book was Wilkins. Martha and Franklin was dead. I do not worry about, you know, harming dead people. <laughs> You know, some people say you should, the memory of it, you should never, but that's, you know. That's, no. and, 
the book just is not... Just don't worry about dead people. <laughs> I mean, you worry about their children, or you, you know, you could do that, but don't worry about what dead people feel. Well, ironically... <laughs> Ironically, it is your book that lights the fuse for her re rehabilitation, for people to rediscover her role well, because I, they're I, offended I know, on but, her behalf. But I never worried about that, whereas Wilkins, <laughs> there was something sad that, you know, that Wilkins put up with Rosalind's outrageous demands. And, and, and he was really, you know... He's the one who was cheated of this great discovery by both his inability to get on with Rosalind Franklin yeah. and by you two stealing his lunch. Yes, yeah. Because, you know, when I saw the, uh, the famous picture of 51, I told Morris, build models. And he said, I'm going to wait till Rosalind leaves, which would be a couple of months. And that was crazy. I said, and Linus Pauling might, you know, might do uh, change his mind. You've got to start building models today. And he didn't. So, uh, you know, uh, but, what but we so the book is at this stage. Its its working title has changed from Honest Jim to Base Pairs. Yes. And Crick doesn't like that. He says, "Why should I be called Base?" <laughs> I know, um, but I thought it was. It's quite you know, a good it was joke. A, it was. It was a joke on Francis. The, the four people involved, Morris, yeah. Rosalind, yourself, yeah. and Francis, are yeah. A, C, G, and yeah. T. Yeah, so I thought uh, <laughs> Base Bears was, you know, a good title, except it was a double meaning. <laughs> and then when did it change to being called the Double Helix? Oh, I think my editor at, uh, at, at, at Harvard Press just thought, you know, we'll have enough problems in publishing the book. Let's not worry about the title. And if you change the title, it doesn't really affect whether how the book is judged, which is... Uh, but uh, the... Uh, 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 an important thing I didn't in include, it was really the relationship between Francis and Morris, uh, was that we had to tell Morris we'd found the answer. And we were both afraid to. <laughs> you know, you know, just call him up and tell Morris. We, so uh, John Kendrew just said, you've got to tell Morris. And he called Morris up to say, that, come up and see what Jim and Francis have done. And before he came up, I, I worried that the only fair thing to do would be to put Morris's name on the manuscript. And uh, uh, I don't put it in the double hit, but Morris does it in his old autobiography written just before he died. He said that uh, I, when I came up, they asked me to put the name on the manuscript, and I turned it down, and it was the biggest mistake of my life, and it's haunted me ever since. That is, because if he hadn't opened that drawer and shown me the picture, and he knew it was a helix, <laughs> you know, it was... Yeah, Morris was not, it was an intelligent man. It was just, he was incapable of, you know, I, you know, I, I can't understand him because it was so much, his behavior was against his self-interest. But uh, he was a very nice person. And then, uh, so when he said no, he didn't want to, of course, Francis and I uh, were sort of relieved. <laughs> You know, who, who, what would be the order of the names? Francis uh, insists... How did you decide the order of the names? Well, Francis insists we flip the coin. <laughs> I, can't so believe I, would, I, I can't believe I would agree to it, because I thought my name should be first. Yeah. <laughs> and it was first. It you, was first. So you but, used a loaded but Francis, coin. Francis, <laughs> and it, it was merely that... You know, I, not only did I find the base period, but I brought the DNA problem and, you know, uh, lived in... Francis didn't live DNA until we found the answer. And then did he live it? I mean, you know... <laughs> but both of you were moonlighting. Neither of you were supposed to be working on DNA. You were supposed to be working on... Myoglobin, weren't you? No, he was working on hemoglobin. Uh, that fall, I was. What was you? What were you supposed to be doing? Uh, well, I worked on tobacco mosaic virus and carried. I, I actually did something. You know, a good minor paper, and then I spent the fall doing bacterial genetics and published, you know, an interesting wrong paper. It turned out totally wrong. <laughs> 
But, you know, no one ever remembers that because, you know, soon afterwards we published the, <laughs> uh, the double helix. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I, 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 you know, my motivation in, in writing the double helix was, I think I wanted to be an author just to prove I could write a good book. And I had a very good story. And I thought the story should be told because, uh, you know, the, the conventional wisdom of how science is done is wrong. And many people, you know, enter a scientific lab and get quite disillusioned. And if they had all started out by reading my book and expecting all science would be like it, they'd be much better prepared for what uh, science is like. So I never thought my book uh, was going to harm anyone, except uh, Morris, when Morris, uh, Lawrence Bragg was, you know, again, very honorable man. I think he's in ch he really told the Swedes that, you know, it would be... Wilkins should be on uh, the Wilkins Nobel Prize, and so it was. And we were very delighted when Wilkins, you know, got the prize. Otherwise, it would have been slightly. If Rosalind you know. Franklin had still been alive at the time of the grant of the Nobel Prize, do you think they'd have? Because you can't give the Nobel Prize to four people, yes. as the rules are three maximum. Do you think they'd have split, given you the medicine prize with Crick, and given, say, the chemistry prize to Wilkins and Franklin? Or do you, no. do you think they'd have left her out? And which which well, would have been you, a travesty? You, you, no, leave no, her. I wouldn't have been a travesty at all. She she, she, she totally she failed. <laughs> no, I mean you know she had she that had the project all to herself for a year or so. She had that picture for eight months, and while holding that picture, she holds up a, a sort of false party called the "Come Celebrate the Death of the Helix." And she had that picture, and then she had some crappy evidence, which I told her was crappy when I saw her, and she didn't like it. <laughs> I said, it's Francis. And, uh, yeah, she was mad at me when I told her that it was crappy. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> you know, science proceeds best if you're honest with people. By the way, um, Chris... So, so uh, uh, it wasn't that... <laughs> You know, I think well, Wilkins turned down putting his name on the paper because he realized he himself didn't find the base pairs and he should have. Yeah. I think that's why he did. Then he afterwards regretted, you know, that... Uh, his name was left off yeah, the most famous see, scientific he, paper of all if time. He'd, now they put, you know, you get uh, your name on a paper if you uh, send a, a strain of yeah. bacteria and you have a hundred names on the paper. Yeah. And by, by today's standard, Morris should certainly have been on the paper. And... Uh, but he didn't know that Rosalind, when he saw, came up, had finally looked at the B picture and concluded it was a helix. And once she heard of our model, then she wrote a paper interpreting Now, Crick and Brenner thought about writing a revenge book after the double helix came out. Uh, the title was going to be something like The Loose Screw. And, <laughs> and the first, they, 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 came, they, couldn't, they never got further than the first line. But uh, the first line was, Jim was always clumsy with his hands. One only had to see him peel an orange. <laughs> but, <laughs> to be fair, Crick very quickly realized that your book was a great book. He forgave you, he patched it up, uh, and he later wrote, rather interestingly, I now appreciate how skillful Jim was, not only in making the book read like a detective story, several people have told me they were unable to put it down, but also by managing to include a surprisingly large amount of science. Um, and I think, you know, so you became friends again, you worked together again. I never really saw us as big enemies, despite the letter. Okay. <laughs> because uh, we were, I, I've ne you know, it's, uh, I've never met a person that I enjoyed talking to as much as Francis. I mean, we, we really, <laughs> You know, think about science the same way we think about people the same way. You know, we're both deeply interested in science. 
and, and you know. But so you, your careers eventually diverge. You you went to Goldsmith Harbour, you, uh, as well as Harvard. You 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 got into cancer. He went in a different direction and got into um, uh, neuroscience. Yes. Um, uh, and sadly, of course, he died in 2004. Um, and uh, at the age of 80. Uh, you know, 80. Eight. Eighty-eight. Sorry. Yeah. No. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Francis had a good life. Yeah. And uh, but you know, he was uh, you know he was a scientist at his best. He really liked science and he liked to think and uh, he offended people. But I think the truth is, if you go through life not offending some people, you're a failure. <laughs> yeah, you can't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's a question of offending the right people, <laughs> and not the wrong people. So, you know, so uh, you have to be prepared to, you know, fight for what's right. And so, uh, I mean, right now, I, you know, I'm fighting all the time. People I consider just. <laughs> and. Uh, Shall we pause at this point and see whether anybody wants to ask a question? Because yeah, I've monopolized the conversation long enough. And um, uh, why, don't we, why don't we see whether anybody wants to ask a question? And you'll have to shout. Um, right behind you, there's a girl. So, um, I just have a question about President Trump, because he said that he wouldn't have Well, I made a great mistake. I didn't go to Leeds when I came to Cambridge, where Asbury had taken x-ray photographs in 1938. Unknown to me, there was a bee photograph up in Leeds. So taking the bee photograph was not a Nobel Prize achievement. No. Was nonetheless the photograph that, that no, helped it, it, you. It was very good, but... Uh, for eight months. You see, the, the letter when you didn't quote from Francis how could she have had that photograph for eight months? He kept assuring me that DNA was not a helix. So she, she, she was not. Somehow her. And look, I, I don't know why she did it, but. Because her failures made me famous. You know, I, I'm just trying to be the truth. She should have found it. She had every reason to find it. Okay. And so, you know, generally you don't give the, you know, the first prize to someone who doesn't cross the finish line. Okay. Yeah, and then you said that she, she didn't really have friends. She didn't, she, obviously she didn't get on with Wilkins. What about Gosling? Gosling were really good friends. Yeah, Ray Gosling, I always think, deserves a little more credit in this, not more credit, but you know, he shouldn't be left out of the story. He did a lot of the work. Yes. No, uh, do you want, Jim, do you want to talk into the microphone? Just so, yes. so, can you please switch your mobiles off and not take photos? Yes. Thank uh, you. Sorry, continue, please. Raymond Gosling. Let's have, let's hear hear what you say about him. He's he's, he's no. still alive, Raymond. Yes, and uh, he uh, yeah he 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 came about twenty years ago and asked me to sign twenty reprints, original reprints of the Double Helix. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> yeah, I owed a lot to him, <laughs> and uh, he's he's very likable. And uh, but he wasn't really interested in DNA. He became a medical physicist. That's what his you know ambition was. And uh, and Rosalind wasn't interested in DNA. She gave it up. You know, I, I mean, you could say well she gave it up because she found you know uh, the personal situation, but. You've got to be prepared in life <laughs> to have diff different, difficult personal situations and somehow survive them. You don't run away. 
She, she just demanded the DNA problem. So uh, afterwards, uh, Rosalind and I didn't become friends, but you know we <laughs> were far from enemies. We talked, and you know, uh, and when she uh, uh, was dying of cancer uh, after the second operation, uh, when I was really very grim, she went and stayed with the quick. She liked Francis. Francis liked her. We became so, very good friends. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't yeah. dislike. I'm going to take another question. Yeah. Rosalind. Anybody else? Yeah, no. there's one. Yeah. You'll have to shout. Um, Professor Watson, looking back on your life in um, a few hundred years' time, do you think people will remember you as one of the greatest scientists ever? <laughs> we'll, did you hear the question? Uh, yeah. Ask Matt. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, in terms of it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a good writer. <laughs> you know, I can write. And, uh, you know... Uh, the way to be a really great scientist in, in terms of eventual history is to be associated with a s discovery of great importance. And yes. that you certainly are. I mean, there is no question but that, yeah. that, that the discovery that uh, the secret of life, the secret of heredity is a... Uh, yeah. is a replicating linear digital yeah. code is an extraordinary moment in the story of yeah, science. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, it didn't give me much sense of security for the first 10 years. You know, it was only after I wrote the molecular biology of the gene and had shown that, you know, uh, my lab at Harvard could produce sort of world-class work without Francis that, because Francis was so dominating that it was very easy to think that he must have been the major person and I was insignificant. Francis was always, you know, very nice by saying uh, neither of us would have done it by ourselves and I think the, that's the answer. Would, um, or as he famously put it, if Jim Watson had been killed by a tennis ball, because you played a lot yes. of tennis, um, I don't think I'd have made that discovery myself. No, because Francis did not have this. I was educated to find the structure of DNA, just like, sort of from uh, my last year of college. That was my big aim. Whereas for Francis, it was not a aim in his life. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and question. I was lucky. I had a superb education and, uh, you know. There's one right here. Yes. Um, you were saying it's very important to choose the problem. If you would start your PhD now, what would you choose? <laughs> I would probably try to find the genes behind mathematical genius. <laughs> I think they probably exist, and uh, uh, the same technique that Mike Wiggler used to find genes behind autism, to find a case of autism where the parents are perfectly normal, not in the history, to go under the assumption it's a new mutation. I tried the same thing when two ordinary parents produced a math prodigy. Not, now, not, you know, dumb parents produced a math, but, you know, ordinary people <laughs> suddenly have a math genius as a child. Uh, my guess is that due to a... Uh, is know, anyone trying... No, no thing. one is because it's politically incorrect. But I, I you know, I, I th you know, the reason I want to do it outside of just curiosity, we might actually find out something which could help people who are not geniuses. <laughs> so it, it might just be a useful fact. Over there. Yeah. Uh, what made you so certain that the structure of DNA was a worthwhile problem to work on? Um, did you ever experience any doubt, and how did you overcome it? What made you so certain that the structure of DNA was a, was a was a worthwhile problem to work on? And did you have any doubt about that? No. No, I mean it was the, the gene was the essence of life. But how did you know the structure would be revealing? And the structure might turn out to be no, complicated it, it and might boring. Be, but you, uh, it might. It was the only thing you could do. It was the next step. So, you know, the structure of RNA turned out to be, in a yeah, way, not very interesting, no, which was the problem you were interested yeah, in sure. later. Uh, no, well, we talked at times, what if the structure is, we find the structure and it's boring. 
Uh-huh. Yeah, well, we we didn't know it was, you know had no assurance it was going to be th- that interesting. We were both surprised that you know we thought we'd find the structure and then we'd have to think about how the structure was copied. Right. You know that was. And had more, Schrodinger played a big part in this? Yeah, we- very big. If uh, Wilkins, uh, Crick, and I all read the book, this it is the book, of, What is Life? Written yes, by I think it was. It defined. I think it was talking about how do you copy information. It, it was that phrase, how do you copy information? And when you think in terms of the brain, what is the big problem? The problem is how do you encode information in the brain? And uh, that's just overwhelmingly important. So, uh, you know, people ask me, how do you know something is important? <laughs> well, I say curing cancer is important, they agree, and then, well, what else? And, you know, you can, Alzheimer's, and, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, to me, uh, there are a lot of things I, I'm curious about and I'd like to do. Uh, I think you have to, you know, have a good education and good teachers, and you've got to be a broad reader, and for which... You know, if you end up not curious and you read all these books, then maybe, you know, you should move to another field. There's a question here. Um, Professor Watson, what do you see as the biggest challenge to science today? Uh, I think the limiting factor is uh, there are not enough really bright people. You know, that's not... Not even in this room. uh, No. Uh, I mean, you know, this is a better selection, but... uh, (laughs) And, uh, you know, you have to to marry sort of, you know, your uh, given type of intelligence to the problem you're working on. So, but I find the limiting thing is just people. Uh, Money is secondary. Sorry, I mean in terms of issues, in terms of things to be discovered. In terms of things to be discovered or to be found out, what do you think is the... Right now, I'm sort of t- totally, almost manic. I want uh, to cure cancer over the next five years. So that sounds usually crazy, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, you know. I'm, but it, 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 there are. But I can tell you reasons why I think what there are other big problems. But to me, curing cancer was I had that ambition when I was twenty. I gave a course on Harvard on cancer fifty years ago. It's been an integral part of my scientific life, so I'm stick with it. There's a question up on the balcony. What's the second most important thing you discovered? Because it's rare in science to have two lucky breaks. Well, Cindy Brenner gets the credit for the discovery of messenger RNA, but... You actually found it in your lab. We found it actually before he did, but we didn't... uh, it's true. Well, we made a mistake of not immediately publishing it for reasons. It was mistake. simultaneous discovery, yeah. actually. Really. But, uh, Messenger RNA is the answer, therefore. Yeah. And, but, uh, and just right now, uh, you know, I want to die uh, before I die to write a book called The Conquest of Cancer. So, you know, that's my. Uh, so, I your think second was, most important discovery may not have been made yet. And, but you're yes. still going to make well, it. Well, no, I won't make it. All I, my role now is generally just to get people to do things which should be done, and you know, get other people to do them. There's a question behind you. You know, Francis was an example. I got Francis to you, to work would, on DNA, and yeah. it really it paid off. You worked for a long time on the Human Genome Project. Do you feel that Craig Ventner, what he's doing now, arrogant fool or good scientist? Come back to the microphone. Uh, I think he gives him. Uh, Craig Venter uh, is a, an excellent scientist. I think he gives himself a little too much credit and doesn't really acknowledge uh, when he's talking about something that, in fact, someone else had invented it, you know, 15 years before. <laughs> so his, you know, but uh, he, he's been good for us. 
in the sense that he uh, forced the human genome project probably to be done three years before. You can say that now. You had your disagreements with him at the time. Yeah, I didn't. Yes. Mm, yeah. But uh, it was actually more a disagreement. I would never with Craig. It was with NIH over patenting these DNA yeah. sequences. Yeah. And uh, I didn't want to patent it. And then I was accused of being un American and not supporting American industry. And I got fired. Well, you got fired for standing for a principle there. On, 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 you, you believed that the Human Genome Project should not yes. be, become private property. Yes, I, I thought it was too important to be private property. Yeah. There's a question here. Um, you mentioned fiscal correctness. Do you think fiscal correctness has had a negative impact on scientific progress? Oh, I think political correctness has had a terrible impact on many American universities. Uh, I don't want to say anything about Cambridge because it's so much nicer to come here and see all the girls. I mean, it was pretty dreary when I was here. <laughs> so, in that sense, political correctness has certainly made Cambridge an even nicer place to be. Uh, but I do think there's a, uh, you know, Well, we're supposed to, to say that everything is equal, you know, that all food is equal. You know, you're not supposed to criticize uh, things, uh, you know, that all cultures, multicultural, all cultures are equal. Well, you know, I don't think so. You know, you, just because, uh, you know, I really like the Anglo-Saxon world. So, you know, I was brought up in Korea, and, you know, uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, Matt and I both really, you know, wish social science didn't exist. <laughs> I think it's the simplest way of putting it, you know. That there's, a, there's a question over there. What's the, the, the Latin, repeat the Latin lover and the English patient joke because I, I can't remember it. Not, not a joke, but it, you know. No, no, no. I, I gave a talk. I got very excited. Uh, now, it was 13 years ago when I, I realized that uh, there was a molecule called pro opium cortin. And you, at one end of it was a hormone called MSH, which makes your skin dark. At the other end, it was an endorphin. And so when you went out in the sun, you felt good. <laughs> and you made vitamin, so you felt good because your body wanted you to make vitamin D. Go out in the sun. <laughs> And so, and then I realized that uh, you only made pro one way of turning on pro there was go in the sun, but that it was turned on by the uh, molecule leptin, which is only made by fat cells. And so thin people don't make endorphins. <laughs> and so thin people are inherently unhappy. And so, <laughs> I then had, uh, and then I was realized that essentially supermodels <laughs> make no endorphins, and so they have to be on drugs. So that explained Kate Moss. Okay, very that simple. Kate all right. Moss. So th that was the. Very good. All right. But, but, you know, but it did imply, and then I realized that anorexic women run because you also can make endorphins by running. So people who run, you know, they're inherently unhappy people, but when they run, they feel happy. Yeah. Okay? That's right. Uh, and yeah, so, so, so the, the moral, and then, yeah. But uh, that, that was basically, I never published it, but I really... <laughs> 
No, but, I, I, but then I was at a meeting on uh, Milana Corte and, and the Sun, and someone had the same idea as he, and he thought it was original, and I'd had it, and it was in the newspapers. And but basically, the thin women at Berkeley didn't tell me, didn't like me for coming out and saying avoid them. <laughs> you know that there was a reason why British kings liked plump women. <laughs> okay, that, so it was partly a joke, but maybe true. So, you yeah. know, there, there was enough truth to it. And I really felt, you know, why do you associate the fashion world with drugs? Well, they're, they're so ugly and thin. <laughs> um, well, that, that was it. I thought it was one of my better ideas. And... <laughs> One more question. A hand up over there. Professor Watson, you're on record as saying that you would have courted a child if you'd known it had a serious mental illness. I have bipolar disorder, which is a genetically carried disease. Do you think it would be unethical of me to have children? What was the... I didn't... Yeah, I couldn't hear the... Uh, Professor Watson, I was reading an article that... Uh, yeah, they heard the first bit. It was the... It was the a British the newspaper where you said that you would have reported the fetus of a child with a mental illness. Um, I have bipolar disorder, which is a genetically carried disease, and I'd like to know... Bipolar disorder. <laughs> and I'd like to know whether you think it would be unethical of me in these circumstances to have children. Oh, what was the... Would it be unethical for, bi for people with bipolar disorder to have children? I'd say no. No. But, uh, uh, but one of the things, you know, we're trying to do is to find these genes so you can have pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and you hope, you know, that we'll have better drugs to control bipolar. Uh, the trouble is we really haven't come up with really anything much better in 40 years, so that's, that's a long time. Uh, and uh, you have, a, I think, a, a stronger... Uh, you know, uh, uh, the answer would be easier on schizophrenia, where you know it passes as a dominant. Uh, John Nash has a son who's schizophrenic, <laughs> and uh, but you know, <laughs> the schizophrenic life is so difficult. I I don't want to <laughs> make it harder by calling them unethical. I I think you know. It's uh, uh, right now, you know, we're uh, hoping, you know, to have a very big brain genome project and find the genes. I, I want to focus on bipolar because uh, there's so many bipolars are so, you know, uh, uh, helpful to society <laughs> that, uh, uh, you know, if you just could find some way to, you know, stop that awful depression that can go with it. Uh, it would be uh, wonderful. And possibly it'll turn out to be a little genetically simpler than schizophrenia. But schizophrenia probably has uh, certainly several hundred genes potentially involved. And bipolar, we don't know. But... Uh, 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 you know, and on these ethical things, uh, I think they're so hard. I, 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 my feeling is I don't want to judge anyone else. That's, <laughs> a, know, great, that's a great line to, yeah. to end on.